I'm based at the Rowett Institute, which is part of the University of Aberdeen, and I'm a professor of human nutrition. So welcome to today's workshop, which is looking at psychological input into digitally enabled weight management programmes. It's great to see such uh, positive um, response to this workshop and I know I'm really looking forward to today's speakers. Um, we have two people um, who are going to lead the presentations and the discussion today. So first of all, we've got Dr Victoria Lawson, who's clinical lead for psychology at Oviva, and, we, and she's supported uh, and jointly sharing the task with uh, Juliet Finney, who is a, a registered dietitian, and she's the clinical lead for diabetes structured education and tier three management. So great um, to have their expertise on the call today. Oh, oh, oh. I'll just shove some of these windows out the way. Uh, a little few words about my role, and that is that uh, I am the chairperson for the Association for the Study of Obesity. What I'll do is put in the chat uh, at the end if you're interested in joining our network. Uh, we promote. Um, share discussion between academics, students, practitioners and the lived experience from patient groups, really trying to inform practice aimed at uh, helping those that are living with obesity. So uh, very much welcome new members and we uh, organise a conference once a year on online um, discussions uh, about different topics. Last month was it was great fun. It was about dietary fibre and obesity. So welcome to join that. Next slide. So now I'm going to pass over to Juliet to tell you a little bit more of Eva. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. Um, so a bit of background uh, for those of you who don't know as to who we are at Oviva. So Oviva is a digital behaviour change provider. Um, and what we specialise in is combining our digital tools with specialist healthcare input and using that our digital tools to connect our patients to our, our specialist healthcare professionals. Um, we work in partnership with the NHS um, across areas um, within Scotland, as, as you probably know, and also England and Wales as well. Um, and we provide a range of programmes for diabetes, diabetes prevention, um, weight management, obesity um, and adult and paediatric nutrition. Um, and we, we do that around the provision of um, dietary support and advice, activity advice, group care, connecting peers, and also specialist healthcare input. And just to explain some of the terminology um, that we'll be using throughout the, the presentation today to help to set the scene, um, so that these words are used widely and sometimes differently in different contexts. So the way that we'll be using the terminology today is face-to-face um, -face care. That would be anything involving directly the, the, the patient and the healthcare professional in the room together where they're both physically present. Um, remote care, that would be um, trying to reproduce face-to-face um, -face care using technology such as video call or phone call, so, so live interaction um, but done remotely through, through video or phone. Um, digital care alone um, would be an individual using a digital product or platform without human interaction. And then digitally enabled care would, would be using that, that technology to, to bring the interaction between the, the patient and a, a healthcare professional. So combining the technology with, with the human support um, in, in combination, which is one of the things that we specialise in at Oviva. Thank you. Okay. Um... Thank you, Juliet. So what I want to do now is just do a quick poll. So the first question is rate your knowledge and supporting patients with binge eating disorder risk. Um, and there's a range of options there and it looks like people in, in terms of there's a live feed here on the screen. But if people are going for a sort of mid option of OK or low, then it would be very good to be expert. OK. Mm 
want to go on to the next question? Yeah, it's popped up. So choose something. How important do you think it is to take binge eating disorder risk into account with weight management? Here. It looks like the response is very much extremely important. Brilliant. OK, so thank you for taking part in the poll. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, hand over to uh, Dr Victoria Lawson. So Vicky, over to you. Looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. I'll mute. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. And um, hi, everyone. And thank you for taking part in that poll. Um, I'm um, yeah delighted to sort of see the results. I was also thinking, where would I score myself on my own knowledge? And I think I'm like the, the rest of you, I don't think I'm an expert in this area at all, but it's certainly a, a topic that's very interesting to me and um, uh, very important as well. So I'm very pleased to be here. Um, and uh, just to um, let you know, um, my background is actually I'm a chartered health psychologist. And I know there are a number of health psychologists and trainee health psychologists on this call today. So a very warm welcome. And we've also got some of the um, partners that we work with in Scotland joining us today as well, some of the clinicians. So I'm really pleased that you could join us too. Thank you. Um, so, next slide, please. So today, what I would like to talk about, um, as you probably gathered, is binge eating disorder and how it fits into weight management services. Um, so um, I'm going to have to go fast. Um, I'm, I'm thinking we will, we will be circulating the slides afterwards anyway, and also you can um, contact me if you've got any questions about things we've had to skim through. Um, and there also will be some time, we'll leave some time for discussion and questions at the end too. But I'm hoping to cover um, what we mean by binge eating disorder, prevalence, um, look at some of the ways that we might diagnose and also how we might assess risk of binge eating disorder. Um, weight loss and binge eating disorder and how the sort of the two sit together or don't sit together. Um, what we do at Aviva about managing um, binge eating risk and some of the challenges that we've identified over the years and also for patients who are moderate risk, how we might support those patients and then just a few finishing with a few ideas about how we can work with people with binge eating risk. So. Um, just a quick refresher for you. Um, binge eating disorder, as, de as defined by the Diagnostic and Statistical Man Manual of uh, Mental Disorders, um, is eating a discrete uh, amount of food um, within a, a two hour period and a, an amount of food that is definitely larger than most people would eat in a similar period under similar circumstances and also a lack of control over eating during the episode feeling that one can't stop eating or can't control how much one is eating. So those are the first two items on the DSM. And um, in addition to that, uh, DSM specifies the need for three or more of the following. So eating more rapidly than normal, eating till feeling uncomfortably full, eating large amounts of full, uh, food when not physically hungry, um, eating alone because of feelings of embarrassment or um, also feelings of dis um, guilt, uh, depression, et cetera, discussed. And um, in addition, uh, for binge eating disorder to be uh, diagnosed, we're looking for marked distress in response to the binges um, occurring at least once a week for over th for three months or more. Um, and it's not associated with um, compensatory behaviours, which we would more often see in, um, uh, say, bulimia. So, um, so, not, so not looking for, we wouldn't be expecting to see behaviours such as purging, um, overcompensating with exercise, those types of um, compensatory behaviours, purging related behaviours, really. Next slide, please. So in terms of prevalence, um, this is from a review that was carried out in 2021, so is relatively up to date. There's lots of um, variation, I think, in prevalence, obviously, because of how we uh, identify uh, different eating disorders. But um, these are, I think these sort of 
These coincide with the figures we see elsewhere as well. So we're looking at anorexia of, of, of about um, one to two percent, bulimia just under one percent. This is in populations, um, not within eating disorder populations, of course. So this is in national populations, um, and then binge eating disorder at about one and a half percent. And um, Interestingly, when we look at health professional attitudes and general population attitudes towards binge eating disorder compared to other eating disorders, it's the general view um, in the literature is that it's seen as less impairing um, and less severe, easier to treat, and that um, people with binge eating disorder are viewed as more to blame and lacking in self-discipline. Um, than people with other eating disorders. And I think this is really interesting if we also contextualize that within a, a sort of a culture and a society where we have significant issues with, with weight stigma, um, which impact uh, multiple levels in terms of treatment and also you know, definitely how somebody is experiencing themselves day to day, but also the, the type of, as is shown here, you know, the type of um, support that may be available and the type of, um, uh, sort of uh, sympathy that may be accorded to somebody experiencing an eating disorder is not the same across the board for different eating disorders and binge eating is definitely I think what we could call the sort of the, the Cinderella eating disorder in terms of um, well in many areas both in terms of access to treatment um, access to funding for treatment of binge eating disorder but I will stop there. I won't go on about that. That's another that's another uh, webinar for another time. Um, and I think also the final point there is important to bear in mind when we're talking to people who may be at risk of binge eating disorder, um, that there's very low levels of public awareness about bed um, and that it is actually an eating disorder. And I think you know one of the things that we come across quite a lot in our service is the way that the terminology around binging is used. And binging is a is a word that sort of entered our general culture, really, isn't it? I mean, think about people say, oh, I binge on Netflix or I binge on this, that and the other. And actually, when we're talking about binging, well, of course, we're talking about food, but even when somebody's talking about binging relating to what they're eating, what is a binge? I mean, I think, you know, we, we had the DSM uh, criteria earlier, but what is a significant amount of food compared to somebody else in a similar time period? I mean, it's, it, it is very difficult. Um, and so I think that all of that ties in and um, helps to perpetuate the, the sort of the public awareness around binge eating disorder, as well as many other things. But again, I won't go on about that right now. Next slide, please. So in terms of binge eating disorder risk, which um, we will go on to talk about in the context of our tier three weight management service, um, uh, we are looking at risk. We are not looking at diagnosis, but I wanted to just give you a, a little taster of some of the things that might be used in di actually diagnosing binge eating disorder rather than identifying risk that then needs to go on and be more fully assessed. So uh, it's probably some of you are already aware that sort of the gold standard is a semi-structured interview, um, the eating disorder examination, um, which uh, was developed by Christopher Fairburn and, co and colleagues uh, many years ago now, which is uh, an in-depth structured, semi-structured interview uh, process. Usually, you know, when I've conducted this in the past myself and other services, it will take about an hour and a half to two hours to do a full assessment of a patient to uh, identify their, if they have an eating disorder or not. This is a transdiagnostic approach to eating disorders, which is very much the sort of the Christopher Fairburn credo approach, which is um, Sort of widely sort of accepted across the NHS as well. So that by, by transdiagnostic, I'm meaning that you know many of the underlying symptoms and drivers of eating disorders, be that anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, or any other type of eating disorder, are actually very, very similar. Um, and so this would actually identify uh, eating disorder you know of, of a sort of any type um, and you can access that interview it's really interesting to see the questions actually just to sort of get an idea of it get a feel for it um, and just how extensive it is and how much detail is needed to really make that diagnosis so if you go onto the credo website you'll be able to just access that for free and there's loads of great resources on the credo website which is the one that's set up by Christopher Fairburn and colleagues in Oxford and um, 
Another um, diagnostic tool that is um, used is not as um, comprehensive, but it's um, uh, a lot easier to administer than doing an hour and a half to two hour interview, um, is a, um, a, a, a self-report questionnaire that very well validated the good psychometric properties, which is the EDEQ, which again was developed by Christopher Fairburn. But it's quite long and it's quite detailed. Um, and sometimes when I've run this in the past with people, they need some support in completing some of this. Um, it's quick, some of the questions are quite complicated. And then again, it's a transdiagnostic questionnaire. So some of the questions aren't necessarily as relevant to people with binge eating disorder as they would be for somebody with, say, with anorexia. Um, and then the other one that I've just popped up there is another example is the EDE. QS, which is a short version of the EDEQ, which has also got very good psychometric properties. So these are, again, useful tools, self-report again, questionnaire. Um, and one of the advantages of the EDEQS was that um, it asks people to score their uh, sort of behaviours and beliefs over seven, not 28 days. Because when we're doing self-report items with patients, of course, it's very hard for them to think, well, what was I doing 28 days ago? I mean, I can you remember what you were doing 28 days ago? How you felt about something 28 days ago? Very difficult to do that just on a piece of paper. So um, this uh, shorter version took that into account that actually, although that's the ideal, it's very hard for patients to recall that. Um, so it's, it's, it's a shorter version. Of course, if we're doing it in an interview, a semi-structured interview, and it's one-to-one, -one, it's easier to sort of prompt and probe around that. Um, so, but EDQS has got, um, it's got good uh, psychometric properties as well. So it's definitely worth a look at. Um, next slide, please. So um, at Aviva, we are not in a position to diagnose binge eating disorder and don't attempt to diagnose binge eating disorder. What we're trying to do is we're trying to, trying to identify risk so that people can go on and have, if needed, they can go on and have a sort of a proper eating disorder question, uh, eating disorder assessment. Um, so just a, a few of the risk assessment tools that um, we, you know, we've sort of considered in the past, um, we're actually using the binge eating disorder screener, the bed seven, which you'll see there, and I'll talk about in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, and, but also other ones that are popularly used, the binge eating scale, the, the best 16, which is a, is a helpful measure. Um, I've just put up there SCOF as well, because SCOF is a measure that often comes up, particularly, I think, um, uh, in sort of eating disorder services. And it's also, it's very short SCOF, and it's only five items. Um, but I just wanted to mention it because it's actually not appropriate for assessing bed. This is a tool, SCOF is a tool that's used to uh, quickly give an idea of risk for uh, bulimia and for anorexia, not for bed. And very occasionally we do see um, people being assessed for bed on SCOF and it doesn't, it doesn't work. And there's, there's sort of quite good evidence that it's not suitable um, for, for beds, just to mention that when you're looking around for scales. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we use the bed seven at Aviva. Um, part of the reason for that is because we're not, you know, we, we, we have a lot of other questions that when somebody comes on board with us, when they come into our tier three service, which is primarily where we're trying to identify um, bed risk, um, we are having to ask them a lot for a lot of other information, a lot of um, medical, physical health information as well. And so what we needed is we needed a screening tool that was well validated and um, was able to be completed quickly and is quite sort of simple and is also bed specific. So um, the bed seven items are during the last three months, um, you can see the DSM criteria in this, can't you? During the last three months, have you had any episodes of excessive overeating? Do you feel distressed about your excessive overeating? Um, and then if people answer yes to one and two, the follow up questions are rated um, on a five point scale from rarely to often. And then they are people ask, answer no control over eating, eating in the absence of hunger, embarrassment during um, the episode discussed or guilt, guilt afterwards. And there is a purging question on there as well, because originally this was developed as a uh, screening tool for GPs 
um, and who also needed to find out around purging. And we likewise need to know about um, any episodes of purging. So although it's not a, a, a bed symptom um, of risk, uh, it's certainly something that we uh, need to be aware of. So the question is on there as well. Um, and one of our exclusion criteria is actually around purging um, for, our, for our programs because it does actually sort of indicate possible bulimia and all the complications that might come with that. Um, so we're very careful around episodes of purging. Next slide, please. OK, so in terms of um, the prevalence that we see, I gave the uh, prevalence, the sort of the global prevalence uh, stats uh, earlier on. Um, as you can see from um, this little piece of uh, audit research that we did at Aviva, um, we are not surprisingly getting quite high levels of um, binge eating disorder risk. Now, of course, again, we're talking about risk here. We're not talking the earlier, the prevalence stats I gave you were around uh, people who had diagnosis of an eating disorder. So this is around risk. So although we might identify risk and someone might be very high risk, it doesn't mean that they have a diagnosis of bed. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of the, uh, the numbers that we're seeing. So this is some data that was taken uh, last year, it was a random sample of 115 uh, people on one of our programs, on our tier three weight management program. So we've got nearly 60% with low or no risk. Uh, this is screened using the bed seven. Um, six, just over 16% are mild, moderate, just over 10, moderately high, 11 and a half, and high is three and a half. So we are looking at, thinking of those, those prevalence stats, it was about one and a half for bed. And so we're seeing sort of over double that, but for risk, um, so, and you know, a large proportion of these patients might not actually have a diagnosis of bed. Um, but that just gives you a flavour of what we're seeing. Next slide, please. So, why do we need to know about bed in a tier three weight management program? Well, we know that there's contraindication with binge eating disorder and weight management and weight loss. So um, the sign guidance and the NICE guidance both identifying deliberate attempts at weight loss as um, problematic for people um, with an eating disorder, including binge eating disorder, as it's likely to um, prompt and maintain the disorder and likely to worsen it. Um, and so that's that's the sort of the guidance. Um, and I think this is really important for us to, to bear in mind. Um, next slide, please. I'm just going to put this in some context as well. So if we look at the um, transdiagnostic formulation, which um, Christopher Fairburn and colleagues developed looking at um, eating disorders, um, Again, it's transdiagnostic, so it's across all the eating disorders, but binge eating is obviously in there. And we can see right in the centre there that in terms of what is driving the eating disordered behaviour, dieting and non-compensatory weight control behaviours are a key factor in that. Now, when we're looking at um, dieting and restriction and different forms of restriction, I mean, that's not a sort of a one size fits all. And there's been some really interesting research recently looking at what are the characteristics of dietary restriction for different eating, eating disorders. So it seems to be quite different for um, anorexia and bulimia compared to, say, binge eating disorder. So we're more likely to see um, skipped meals and chaotic eating patterns in binge eating disorder rather than something like um, anorexia, where you would see very small meals, uh, lots of um, calorie restriction, um, and um, in binge eating, this, uh, sorry, in bulimia, there seems to be something around sort of grazing and small meals and sort of lot around portion control. Um, and if anyone's interested in those differences between uh, eating behavior restriction in the different eating disorders, um, let me know and I can uh, let you know the, the details of that paper, which is really, I think, fascinating. But as we can see within that, um, you know, our concern is if we take it, Aviva is going to be that if we take somebody on uh, for our program who has binge eating disorder, when we're going to make it worse. I mean, that's our, you know, that's our number one priority is clinical safety. And it's not necessarily going to be safe for somebody to, to be on our program. So we do need to identify this risk and with a view that then people can get further support outside of our service is, if needed. And to do that, we have a whole triage set, system set up, which my colleague, Juliet, is going to talk us through. Hopefully. 
<laughs> <laughs> or I will, but you know, I think people are tired of me talking now. Thank you, Juliet. Great. Um, so yeah, I'll talk you through how we manage potential risk of, of beds and how we integrate the, our psychology service into our, our tier three programmes at Oviva. Um, so as Vicky has explained very clearly already, our patients um, complete the sign up survey that includes the, the bed seven. And then based on, on the results of that and also their, their general psychological well-being, um, we then um, triage them according to whether they need um, psychological assessments and that initial consultation with a psychologist or not. Um, so we can offer um, guided self-help to, to those people who, who are at um, very low risk, or we can offer an initial consultation with um, a psychologist, um, so Vicky or one of her colleagues, um, or with a, a psychological well-being practitioner for those people who, who are at um, lower risk based on, on the, the bed screening. Um, during that initial consultation, then the, the psychologist or, or PWP gets a much better insight into what's happening. So this the screening gives us a you know a really good indication, first of all, but that consultation gives them a, a much better insight into to real life what's happening with the patient. Um, they can then refer on to our weekly MDT assessment um, where Vicky and I look together at all the cases of potential bed risk and try and use clinical judgment around those as to, to whether they're suitable for the programme or not. So um, as we mentioned, the bed seven gives us a, a good indication, but it's just a screening tool. And as, as Vicky said earlier, there, there's so much variation around what people's perception of a binge is. Um, so they may be reporting that they're binging, but actually when you explore in more detail, it's not really what we would consider to, to be a binge or that there might be other factors happening. Um, so we, we need to use that clinical judgment as well. So we need to look at the whole picture of what's happening from a a dietary perspective, a psychology perspective, the, the reported binging and, and how that actually fits in with reality as well. So we, we try and bring all that together in that MDT assessment. And I think that's that's one of the real strengths of, of you know, what we really benefit from in Oviva is having that close working relationship um, between the dietitian, the dietetic service and the psychology service. And Vicky leads a fantastic team of, of um, psychologists and PWPs give us such an insight into what's going on with, with patients and help us to make that right decision. So rather than just um, you know, discharging people based on a score, we're able to use that that clinical judgment. And for me, being part of those conversations is, is really powerful to, to see the impact of, of the, the psychology on that, because Vicky and her team have such insights into what's going on for patients that as a dietitian, from a dietary perspective, sometimes it's a whole other angle. So you know, I find that that, that MDT working and, and having that psychology insight is so powerful in, in helping us to know whether a patient's suitable for the program um, but also to to work out the right support for them um, so we can offer psychology coaching sessions if needed um, and that's not to um, to treat bed um, so that would be we can we can manage moderate risk of bed and a lot of people with, with the psychology coaching um, and but a lot of the psychology coaching is is around behavior change support um, but we can we can link that with the dietetics and we can work together to think right, what would be the right dietary approach for this person if they are at moderate risk. You know, there's certain dietary approaches that may not work so well for the patients and, and taking into account their individual circumstances as well. So bringing both the dietetics and the psychology together is something that working in these programmes I find particularly powerful. And I think it really helps us to, to support our patients in, in the best way possible. Um, so our outcomes of our, our initial assessments um, and our MDT might be that um, we continue to support the, the patient. We think they're, they're low risk and, and just carry on through the rest of the pathway. Or we might feel that they're at moderate risk and, and we, we offer that psychology coaching to support behaviour change, but also to keep an eye open for any other potential signs of risk that we can come back to and, and discuss again. Um, or in the worst case scenario would be that we would discharge a patient if we did feel 
that they were at high risk of bed. And that's for all of those reasons that Vicky's just mentioned. It wouldn't be safe to proceed and potentially could worsen their, their condition, which is obviously what, what none of us are, are aiming for. And in those cases, patients could come back to us. So if we if we discharge them for bed risk um, and they go away and they have, a, have an assessment and, and hopefully successful treatment for bed and then return to us, they'd be in a much better position to engage with and benefit from the programme. So we would welcome them to, to return to us as well. Um, and, and then again, working together with the dietetics and the psychology hand in hand to really try and achieve those, those best outcomes for the patients. Um, so I'll hand back to, to Vicky now to, to talk about some of the, the challenges. Thank you, Gina. It's really helpful. And, and I, I have to uh, um, sort of echo from a psychologist's point of view how fantastic it is to work with dietitians as well. And we have, as well as Julia, we have really skilled dietitians who are used to working with some level of risk. Binge eating, I mean, we're talking particularly about binge eating today, but also some level of mental health risk as well. Um, so we do really work like a bit of a tag team, I think, to, to you know, sort of bouncing ideas off each other and the fact that we can do things like tailor dietary approaches based on our, any concerns that we might have. Um, and of course, because we have um, the way that Aviva uh, tier three weight management works, we have people's food diaries up in front of us. We have their, them tracking what they're eating. We have them tracking their physical activity. We have them tracking their mood. So when we're doing the NTT review, we actually not only have all the information from the bed seven, the initial consultation, which lasts about 45 minutes with a, the psychologist and a separate one with a dietitian. And then we have what's the patient been doing since those, those initial consultations. So we have a lot of information to go on, which is really, really helpful. But anyway, I'll leave that to one side for a moment. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of the challenges that we face when risk is identified. So at the worst case scenario, as Juliet mentioned, is that um, we need to have a conversation with patients about um, them being discharged um, and because they need further assessment. And this is a conversation that we luckily we don't have to have too often, but is one that we um, certainly don't look forward to having and understandably. And I wanted to just give you a little bit of feedback of um, our experiences um, uh, of doing that and, and what that's like for the patients and how difficult that is for the patients to hear. Um, so understandably, you know, somebody's come along, they've joined up for a weight management program and they have maybe had problems with their eating all their lives and their eating behaviours. But we may be the first uh, first people that have actually said to them, we think there's something more going on here. And so patients are quite um, distressed um, about this and they can be distressed um, as well due to their uh, sort of strong desire to lose weight and strong desire to change their thoughts and beliefs and their feelings about their body image which is what's brought them to us in the first place but maybe what's driving the binge eating as well um, people want to lose weight and they're desperate to lose weight because the, the weight is having a significant impact on their lives so you know there's a physical health impairment um, they may have um, a whole range of issues around pain for example all things I'm so I'm sure that you're, many of you are very aware of. And so for us to sort of say to those very few patients, you know, we don't think this is a good time for you. We'd like some further further assessment is, is really tough for the patient to hear. Um, and um, in addition, they may have um, other mental health issues that they're not getting support about um, as well. Um, and as I was saying earlier, you know, Understanding of binge eating disorder is very low generally. Um, it's pretty low in eating disorders anyway, but particularly I think for binge eating disorder. And um, so people may have never crossed their mind that they just thought it was them. They just thought they had a really difficult relationship, tortured relationship, phrase we often hear with food. And they hadn't considered that it might actually be an eating disorder. And we're very clear when we're having to have those hard conversations with patients that we're not for a moment saying that we think they have got that, but it's only that we're concerned about risk. Um, We've had to trace patients who, um, once we've had those conversations with them, you know, they've threatened to binge if we discharge them, which again is very difficult for the clinicians, clinicians to handle. Um, so thankfully, it's not doesn't happen very often. I think once or twice it's only happened, but it, it is really difficult, really, and a level of the distress that the patients are feeling as well at that time. And also, you know, patients feeling that we're punishing them in some way for how they're eating, which is, you know, complex and deep rooted um, and, uh, yeah, 
not something that it's easy to get into with somebody uh, in a conversation, uh, you know, at a point where we are potentially asking them to go back to their GP and to seek further assessment. So, yeah, some real difficulties with um, for those patients. Um, next slide, please. And I think um, I think sort of other challenges, sort of perhaps zooming out for a moment there is, you know, they're really hard conversations with the clinicians. Um, you know, we're in this we're in this area of work because we want to help. And we're also quite aware that, um, you know, like many NHS services are very stretched at the moment. Eating disorders is very stretched at the moment and particularly treatment for binge eating disorder. And we're sort of aware of that clinician. So we don't know what we're discharging people back to some of the time. Um, there also, um, there's, you know, mentioned a couple of times there, there is a bit of a lack of awareness around bed in the general population that's one of the reasons why this is a topic we were so keen to cover in the webinar today I'm, I'm, I'm aware that a lot of you know a lot of, a lot about this already which is which is great but I think generally um, awareness can be quite low can be quite low amongst um, healthcare professionals as well um, and we're aware that you know particularly post-covid there's even less available for people within eating disorder services and that actually quite a large proportion of eating disorder services have stopped offering treatment for binge eating disorder because they are so overwhelmed by the number of other eating disorders that have developed around anorexia and bulimia which are you know have immediate consequences in terms of being life-threatening for example with anorexia that, that you know there's desperate need to treat those that you know binge eating disorder has to an extent been pushed to one side out of necessity so it makes it very difficult uh, when we know that there's such a limit on the services that are available next slide please so what do we do? So we say we sort of talked a little bit through about those difficult conversations we need to have for the very for the few patients that are discharged. But for those patients that are um, at more moderate risk, who we think we might be able to support, um, as Juliet's already covered some of this. But we know we are looking at what we we can do. We're looking at um, are the ways that we can work with this person, and so we are looking at uh, you know things at that MDT, Juliet and I will quite often discuss, for example, what somebody's eating pattern seems to be. So if we're seeing large, if, you know, there's this not sort of significant distress and the mental health is quite good, for example, but we're seeing very irregular eating patterns, you know, like that patterns that you probably see every day as well, you know, that not eating all day, not eating till sort of six, seven o'clock in the evening or in the afternoon, eating a lot during the evening and then the next morning feeling overly full from the night before, feeling a lot of guilt and regret about what's been eaten the night before and repeating the pattern the next day, not eating all day, trying to restrict, trying to restrict, and then not being able to manage that as the day progresses and going back into another episode of overeating or a binge. If we're noticing things like that, which we can pick up quite quickly on the app by when people are logging, you know, those would be obvious places for us to sort of go in there and try and think about supporting um, for those patients that we are wanting to see if we can work with. They're not those really, really high risk patients. Um, and, you know, I sort of said here it's an art, not a science, which is, uh, you know, I think we, Julie and I sort of think this every time we meet because there's so many factors to take into account and that's why a simple you know screening tool however helpful it is it's never going to be the full picture you know our lives would be a lot easier if there were some people we could just sort of like tick a box and then automatically we would know and we would know sort of conclusively what the risk was and it's just not the case we need to take into so many uh, considerations so many different factors and ensure that it's really personalized to, to, to the patient that we're considering at the time um, we also take on board the fact that the patients that we take on have got moderate risk and who, who they are going to have lower weight loss. And that's something we're very aware of as a service. And so that does affect our outcomes overall for the service. But we still want to take those patients and work with them if we can. We think it's really important that those patients that sort of wouldn't reach a threshold to uh, receive a diagnosis and to receive treatment, even if it were available, that they are supported but they are supported in a way that is sort of binge eating disordered eating aware um so we we sort of do the best that we can with people in that way and i think a sort of final point here which is one that's becoming more and more uh, i think of an issue for us is and, and and something maybe we can discuss at the end is what do we do when we know there's been no binge eating disorder service available for a patient you know 
um, if we wanted to get them assessed, even if they get them assess assessed, because we're really concerned they're very, very high risk, if we discharge back to the GP, there's, we know there's nowhere for them to go. So that's a real dilemma as well, really difficult from a patient safety perspective as well. So lots of things to, to, for us to consider there. Next slide, please. So in things of things that we do do, um, a slightly more positive note, um, so our, our day to day work with people who are these sort of moderate risk patients. So we would be concentrating a lot on regular eating, as you probably gather from what I was just saying just now, um, using the tools that we have available around self monitoring, particularly around food diaries. And it's this MDT approach throughout. So, you know, we try and approach, we might try a dietary approach with a patient, dietitian might try a dietary approach. They will then discuss with the psychologist potentially, if, if it's, that's bringing up any issues. Likewise, psychology might say, mm, we are a bit con concerned about risk. You know, our, you know, if a patient wants to try intermittent fasting, for example, we might want to have a discussion with the patient and with the dietitian about that. Um, and of course, this sort of this, uh, these approaches, these strategies around regular eating and self-monitoring, they are the foundation of actual eating disorder treatment as well. So we sort of feel we're in pretty pretty safe territory here. So if I was working with somebody in a psychology service who had an eating disorder, the first thing I would be looking to do if I was following the CBT protocol is I'd be looking to help them get into a regular eating pattern and to do regular self-monitoring of whatever they were eating. And that's very much what we're looking to do now. So we encourage our patients who are having episodes of overeating and binging to log them. We want to know. Um, it's partly um, to help with uh, sort of de-shaming that, but also so we can give sort of practical support about what's going on there and psychological support. We have behaviour change um, uh, techniques built into the app as well. So things like the food diary and like the self-monitoring is really easy because people can just zap it on their phone and take a photograph. Um, we also have a lot of behaviour change techniques around um, goal setting and um, self-monitoring built into the app so people can set goals. So quite a behavioral activation type approach for those of you who come from more of a psychology background, which is really helpful. So we can, you know, we can sort of cross over techniques from, from different disciplines, which is very helpful and fantastic as well that it is photos because people, you know, my experience in the olden days, people used to write down things in their food diaries and carry around bits of A4 paper and pens and then, you know, they're out and about and they didn't want to do that in front of their family or their friends or at work or whatever. So this is this is great. You know, we're living in a world where everyone takes pictures of what they're eating all the time. So this is not unusual behaviour. So that's so that's really helpful. Um, and having all those reminders and those techniques, etc., built in. Um, course we have the coaching um, so how coaching as uh, Juliet described would either be with a PWP um, or a psychologist and for our, not for the patients we're talking about today people with um, sort of low to no risk patients they might use psychology app coaching as well so we have the co phone coaching from the psychology team and of course we have the phone coaching as well from the dietetics team which is fantastic so again we can we can work together as that final point there says you know there's really close coordination between the patient's dietitian um, and the psychology team so that we can work as a bit of this tag team to support the patient as well next slide please so um just to, to finish up, um, I was asked to sort of uh, suggest some ideas for um, how to work with um, bed risk and sort of, sort of some of the things we've already sort of spoken about in the earlier slides, but just to sort of pull that together as maybe a takeaway for some of you who are newer to working with binge risk. Um, so I think that psychoeducation is really important and we provide quite a lot of that both um, within our coaching, but also within sort of, we have a lot of um, written modules and interactive podcasts and things like that that cover some of this as well so you don't have to try and do it all in the coaching but I think there's a lot of really great psychoeducation materials out there that we can offer our patients but also just talking simply talking through you know that over restriction pattern of you know eating in the evenings and then not eating during the day you know we know that um, patients with binge eating disorder from the evidence from the from the research we know outside of Aviva but it's sort of peer review uh, research we know that one of the key behavior, uh, eating behavior patterns we see in binge eating disorder is um, not having three meals a day um, so although that might sound a bit boring to a lot of our patients you know, we are really encouraging them to try and get into this regular eating pattern and explaining to them why that's so important if they are at risk of binging and overeating just from a physiological perspective. Um, also to consider when we're working with people I think it's important for all of us to consider what dietary approaches uh, are, are recommended um, so 
here caution with fasting and sometimes you know when we're working with patients who are at risk of binge eating um, or have got sort of a moderate risk of binge eating disorder what we may be say, seeing is that they are wanting to push towards those restriction patterns a lot of the time because that's what they're used to so they say no 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 I want to restrict all day and then have a, like a window for eating and it's like my alarm bells are going if that's the case and we need to again have a sort of open conversation with the patient about why we're concerned about that and would they be willing to try something different I know it's, it's about sort of trying experimenting seeing what might work while they've got the support here um, so I think it's very very important for all of us to think about that I think you know in, I say providing self-help resources in line with national guidance because that is the sort of the first the first step approach to uh, the step care model of treating binge eating disorder is to provide self-help resources so I think that's really important to follow. And if anyone's looking for resources or come across anything that they think particularly great, I'm always happy to discuss more resources. Um, think about using a screening tool. So um, it can be a paper one, as I've discussed, yeah, or online one as they are these days, but verbal self-report um, and arrange for an eating disorders assessment if needed. If you're working with somebody, you think, actually, I've done a screening, a screening tool with them. There seems to be some risk there. Is there a possibility of getting them properly assessed by an eating disorder service. Um, carriage regular eating and self-monitoring um, and also recognizing the professional limits as well of what we can do. And that's something that we're sort of always keen to try and do at Aviva because you know, much as we would want to treat some of the binge eating disorder, probably you know, at least have a better understanding, you know, if we, if we do think it's there quite strongly, you know, could we do diagnostic interview? Could we then treat it? But we know that we can't do that within a tier three service. We've got to be realistic about what we can do. And I think that's quite tough for all of us to do sometimes. So um, just being aware of that and when we need additional support around that for all of us, I think is, is really important. So I think, I hope I haven't gone too fast, but I think we're just about at the end of the slides now. And so thank you all for your attention. Do we have any questions? Yes, thanks Vicky. Um, if I chip in, I can see um, there's some questions already. So when you were presenting some of the screening and you presented a pie chart on using bed seven and, and you presented some data on moderate risk and high risk. So um, there's a question from Lisa saying, how did you categorise high, medium, et cetera, for the bed seven tool? We actually um, developed a, a cutoff scoring system for it. So we excluded the purging question because that's uh, not. Oh, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Karen. So we excluded the purging question, but then we um, uh, did a uh, sort of a so we, we sort of uh, stratified by different levels based on clinical experience and on the literature as well in terms of what we were expecting to see at what level and also using obviously the original paper because bed seven was first of all developed as a conversational tool for GPs which is how we used it originally so we had quite a lot of experience of using the bed seven and what levels were going to be uh, within so we used it for about a year as a conversational tool before we moved it into as, as Juliet was saying actually being a paper so to speak, screening tool. Um, and the reason for doing that is because it's then it's a lot easier for us to track. So this, this actually, this piece of research was done manually by one of the PWPs going back through 116, 100, sorry, 115 consultations and trying to assess it based on that. So now we have it uh, built in, that's a lot easier. And then also we can track um, obviously pre and post because we'll ask people to complete it afterwards. Okay. Yeah, lots of questions come in the chat, which is great. Just type them in and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, Emily's asking, can you tell us a little bit more about the behaviour change techniques that you use? Yeah, of course. Um, well, you probably won't be surprised to hear that um, self-monitoring and goal setting and problem solving are really key, both in terms of the coaching sessions, but also built into the app. Um, and so we do a lot of training for our staff in terms of how to use the BCTs. And I've just finished a year long program of BC tra training workshops for all our staff about how to use the different behavior change techniques. And we know from the literature which ones are, well, we have, you know, can we know the literature? We have a very good sense from the literature about which ones are most effective for weight management. So we concentrate on those. And those are goal setting and self monitoring. Um, but we have others built in as well. Um, so yeah, those are those are the main ones we use. They're used through the app and they're through used through coaching. 
Great. Now, I could see that Carol Noble, um, she's NHS, could I you nude your hand up and then it came down again. So, Carol, um, did you want yeah. to ask something? Can you introduce Can you, yourself? Yeah, yeah uh, I was going to do it in the chat, but since you've come back to me. Yes, yeah, so Carol Noble, I'm a lead dietitian for Aberdeen City <clears throat> um, with an NHS grampian. So, I've got two very quick questions, I think. So, you mentioned, I was just having to go back my notes, but you were saying that in why is attempting weight loss in bed problematic? So you mentioned it would prompt maintain or worsen the binge eating disorder. But is that the same in those that are at risk of a binge eating disorder as opposed to it's so is that what you mean? Is it those we would diagnose with a eat a binge eating disorder where attempting weight loss might worsen it? And is it the same in those who are at risk? Um hard to say for the at risk group because I think it's very under researched and even within the one even within people who um, go on to have a diagnosis of binge eating disorder as I was mentioning it seems to be different types of dietary restriction that seem to have a, have an impact but certainly within binge eating disorder as with any eating disorder it would be sort of contraindicated yeah. for that reason. Julia I don't know if you had anything to, to add to that at all. Yeah, no, I, I think that sums it up well. Um, and, and I think it's it's a spectrum. So you, you've got bed at one end and then you've got a level of risk as as it goes along. And, and I think, as Vicky said, it's that it's that heavy restriction that, that can be the most damaging thing. And I think sometimes people, if they can get past the, the really restriction and binge cycle, then they might actually find that their weight starts to drop anyway. So even though they're not actively aiming for weight loss, if we can establish that regular eating pattern, whether they're, they've got bed or they're at high risk then the the weight loss is almost secondary to that that improvement in health and in eating patterns okay okay and can I ask this quickly then as well so it's kind of related so again you were saying you know caution with fasting so um <clears throat> and I think I know what you mean by fasting but where would you sit with something like the total diet replacement type of therapy is that would you would you is that considered fasting so in a nutshell, it's not considered fasting. Um, and, and Vicky and I have had loads of really interesting conversations around this because we, we do offer TDR in, in many of our contract areas in, in our tier three weight management programme. So it's something that we need to, to know how to tackle. When you look at the evidence around potential binge risk in high risk patients with TDR, it's very mixed. Um, so there, there is some evidence in support of um, TDR potentially helping to, to regulate patterns, but also some evidence that in some people it can make things more, more risky. So we tend to take it very much on a case by case basis. But if you have somebody who has a, a very um, irregular eating pattern maybe goes a long period of time without eating actually the TDR can can work really well because they have to fit in their port four products per day they have to then establish that regular eating pattern so it becomes part of that that regular eating pattern getting used to regularly fitting in spreading out those four products over the day and then we can then transition that into a regular food pattern at the food reintroduction and, and I think that's where the the psych coaching really becomes absolutely essential so when we get to that that food reintroduction phase that we can we can do that with the psych coaching to make sure that, that that's done in the right way that that translates to a regular eating pattern so it can work it, it can work really well um but it has to be with it with the right support and also not for every patient and we would try and use our clinical judgment as to who that would be best for okay thank you that's really useful thanks Got three questions and four minutes. Right. So uh, you've talked about tier three. Um, do Oviva offer a tier two service? That's for Marion. Yes. <laughs> okay. Quick answer, Juliet can probably give a more sophisticated answer than that. Right. Yeah, okay. we, do, um, we do offer a twelve week yeah, tier two service. I know you've got some resources to share um, with the recordings. So that's brilliant. Um, how does a patient get referred or signed up to the weight management service? In short, by the GP. It's where we have um, NHS contracts in in the area, um, and then people come by their GP or by their local weight management service or their uh, weight management dietitian. Yeah, so it needs to be um, it needs to be set up in the local area that the person's uh, aligned to. Okay, that's great. Um, in the instance where that you mentioned where there appears to be a high risk, 
for bed? Do you know there is no other support available for the patient once Oviva, they leave Oviva? How is this handled? I think you touched on that, that that's a problem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Really, it really depends on how high the risk is. Um, and um, but we we can't keep people if then if not, we can write to their GP. Um, but we you know we really can't people but keep people. But we do we do try with some people, don't we, Julia? People that we think well, they're really like could we could we try? So I would coach, for example, and we would usually leave. We usually start coaching at twelve weeks. But if we think someone's high risk, we'll I'll be in there the following week. Um, and we'll do the we'll do the bed seven again. Be quite open with what's going on. And so far, um, that's we you know that that's sort of tended to go quite well. It's far from ideal. What we would like is better binge eating services. Um, and uh, I suppose that's my you know, one of my my ulterior motives for doing this webinar. <laughs> okay, and then, um, the last question: um, How do you approach bed risk in the tier two services? Marion asked a follow up. Yep. I might have to hand over to you there, Julia. Uh, yeah, so it, it's because the tier two is a 12 week service rather than a 12 month service and it is not as specialist. We can't offer the same level of psychology input, unfortunately. So it would be more a case of discharging to a local service. And um, we wouldn't unfortunately be able to offer the same psychology coaching support that we do in our, our um, specialist tier three service. It's not a requirement for tier two to have any psychology input. so. We're a bit okay. sort of yeah, hands tied with that one. Okay. And what do you mean by coaching? That's from Alison. Um, I think Juliet just mentioned that again just now. So. Yeah, so phone calls um, with a psychologist or a PWP. And as um, Vicky mentioned, we can do that via the app, but only in our, our low risk patients. So nobody who's at significant bed risk we would be messaging over our Oviva app. But generally it's done via phone calls. And that would be that's there's a modular curriculum for that, which we have flexibility around. It's not rigid, but we have a range of resources and a range of topics that we would try and cover in coaching around body image, mindful eating, um, sort of stress management techniques, emotional regulation, those types of you know very pertinent issues for, for people as well. OK, so that's us just uh, almost out of time. So just to say thank you to our two speakers today. Um, thank you for those that have joined for your participation and um, really excellent um, questions. And yeah, just say, um, yeah, thank you for your for your interest. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks for joining us today.